Okay, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, an effect which is quite prevalent. We'll see it quite a lot, especially when we're flying at high speed and there's lots of theories attached to it. Um, you'll know this as either roll-induced drag or as transient torque spikes. There are quite a lot of theories behind um, why this happens. And I'm going to talk about one, uh, one theory in particular, which I think is correct. And I'm just going to very quickly on a scratch pad, just talk about a more common theory um, and just try and explain why I don't think it's quite right. Um, and so we'll start with the scratch pad and just look at that one. OK, so here is um, our rotor test looking down from above again. So anti-clockwise rotating. We've got an advancing blade on this side and we've got a retreating blade on this side. Um, and so if you've um, ever seen it before, if you're flying along, especially at relatively high speed or high power settings, if you do a, a roll to the left, in this particular instance here where we've got the retreating side on the left hand side, what you'll notice is that you get an increase in torque and then conversely if we roll to the right we get a decrease in torque. Um, at the same time, if you're in auto rotation, what you'll find is if you roll over to the retreating side, then what you tend to find is you get an increase in N, sorry, a reduction in NR. And if you roll over towards the advancing side, then you'll get an increase in NR. And one of the theories behind this is that as we roll over to one side or the other, and in this particular case, we'll look at rolling over towards the retreating side. The way we achieve that is by tilting the disc over towards the retreating side. And the way we achieve that is by lifting the blade on the advancing side. And again, the way we achieve that is by increasing the pitch angle. Um, because we increase the pitch angle on that advancing side, we are increasing the profile exposure to the relative airflow. And therefore, if we've got an increase in exposure to the relative airflow, we're going to increase the drag. And so if we do a very crude uh, look at the, the vector diagram on that side, so we would have a uh, induced flow here, obviously, we'd have our relative airflow. Um, this is our steady state pitch angle for the, for the advancing side blade. And then when we add pitch to it in order to roll over towards the retreating side, we're clearly going to add A, the pitch, but we're also going to, with that, add the angle of attack and make the angle of attack bigger. So what's that done to the lift vector? Well, steady state, the lift vector probably looked something like that, um, perpendicular to the relative airflow. Because the relative airflow hasn't changed at all, it's only the pitch angle, although this is heavily simplified, um, we've still got the same angle of the lift vector, but because we've got a larger angle of attack, we're gonna end up with a larger lift vector. So looking at this uh, side in particular, we can see that we've got um, a larger lift, um, magnitude of lift here. Now, from a simplistic level, the distance uh, from the y-axis here represents the induced drag, because that's how much horizontal component there is working against uh, the uh, blade in the opposite direction to its movements. That's, we've obviously got an increase in induced drag, but we've also got an increase in uh, profile or form drag in reality here because we're increasing the profile exposure to the to the uh, relative airflow. So in simplistic terms, what we're doing is we are increasing pitch on the advancing side, but because the advancing side has got such a high dynamic pressure in, compared to, in comparison to the retreating side, the theory here is that any increase on drag on the advancing side is going to create uh, or be much more dominant over the entire disc uh, than any increase in drag on the retreating side. Uh, simply because this dynamic pressure is so much larger than the dynamic pressure on the retreating side. Um, if I drew the vector diagram on this side, again, you'd see the exact opposite. You'd see the pitch angle reduce and you'd also see the lift vector reduce um, and, and you'd see a, a, a reduction in, in drag on the retreating side. Um, if we were going to add even more detail into it, you would obviously see that by moving the blade upwards, we're also going to get a, um, an increase in induced flow because as the, the blade flaps upwards on the advancing side, um, it's going to cr you know, create a down, downwards um, uh, movement of air through the disc, so an increase in induced flow, which is going to change our relative air flow, which is going to tilt that lift vector back forwards, reduce that in induced drag, and also reduce the angle of attack, so bring the lift vector down a bit. And so you'd probably see the lift vector come down to somewhere like this, maybe. Um, 
So you would see a, a slight reduction in the amount of, of lift you are achieving and therefore drag, and we could do the same on this side. Um, the main issue with this theory, although it seems um, you know, pretty logical um, from the, the point of view of the dynamic pressure and the increase in drag and the decrease in drag, where this falls down is in two ways. First of all, this is not to scale, um, so this is a highly simplified. And so you have to take into account the fact that the pitch angle on the advancing side is actually going to be at steady state vastly uh, reduced in comparison to the pitch angle on the retreating side. As we saw in the retreating blade stall video, the, um, we don't need as much pitch on the advancing side because we've got such high dynamic pressure. Um, therefore, the amount of movement we'll have on each side um, will be much smaller than what I've, I've demonstrated here. These lift vectors will be different in, in size. It's all very much simplified. But the biggest issue with this theory is that what you'll find if you are flying along high speed and you roll uh, very gently over to the retreating side, you won't really see any increase in torque. Um, and if you then roll very aggressively over to the retreating side, you will see a definite increase in torque. And what we find is that the more aggressive we roll to the left and the right, the more uh, dynamic the torque changes are and the, the larger the torque changes are. So in accordance with this theory, if it's literally just the change in the profile we're doing here and the change in the pitch angle, um, and therefore this is, as you can see, in requiring an increase in torque, it shouldn't matter how far you roll, how hard you roll left or right, you have to change the pitch angle the same amount in order to tilt the disc, you know, 30 degrees, etc. So there's something else there. And in this particular case, it's the rate of roll, uh, which is causing the, um, the increase in torque. So what changes during a, a roll? What changes the rate of roll? Uh, and if I increase my the speed that I'm I'm rolling at, what am I actually increasing? Well, I'm actually increasing the rate of airflow coming down through the um, the disc on the lifting side, and um, coming up through the disc on the uh, retreating side. So that's what we'll look at today, and that's the theory that I'm going to uh, talk through today. Okay, so what we're going to look at then is this particular theory on roll-induced drag or transient torque spikes. Uh, so this is how we're going to start then. We've got our rotor blade looking from above. As always, it's going in an anti-clockwise manner. You'll note we've got a forward airflow. We need to have that forward airflow because what you'll find is in a static hover with no other wind, we won't have a dissymmetry of lift due to the, the difference in the rotational speed on the advancing side and the retreating side. All the blades will have the same rotational speed, and as you see, it won't really make any difference in that case if we rolled in a zero wind or zero airspeed environment. Uh, the other ones we've got here, we've got the, the advancing blade on this side and we've got the retreating blade on this side. And you'll notice two major things. Uh, first of all, I've got a, a slightly uh, lower pitch angle on the blade on the advancing side and I've got a pretty extreme angle on the retreating side. This isn't essential, just trying to keep it relatively accurate. Um, and also, most importantly, you've got a very long rotational airflow here um, because obviously we've got much faster rotational airflow on this side. And then you've got a very short rotational airflow on this side. Um, as you would do on the retreating blade. So that is our start point. We've already got our induced flow on here as well. And you'll see that induced flow is the same on either side. And we're just um, assuming that the aircraft is moving uh, forwards or so in this direction um, into the airflow. And so tilted over, creating an element of induced flow because of the tilt, but also because of the, the general hairdryer effect we've got. Um, and then ready down the bottom here, we've got um, our uh, coefficient of drag um, curve and also a coefficient of lift curve which we'll get to in a little bit. So these are our start points. So what we're going to assume here uh, and we're going to focus uh, just on one particular aspect and we'll go for a, a left roll, so a roll towards the uh, retreating side. So we have initiated the turn to the left and in order to do that what we've done is we've increased the angle of attack on this side by increasing the pitch and we've reduced it on this side. Uh, what that's going to initiate is the blade raising up to the um, uh, over towards the right hand side or towards the advancing side and our angle of attack has essentially increased created more lift uh, on that side and tilted the blade or, or the whole disc over to this side. So what we need to have a look at now is what our start point is but in particular in relation to the drag curve. 
which you might not have seen before. So I'm going to draw the drag curve straight over the top of um, the uh, lift chart here as well. And the drag curve is a little bit different. So it tends to start off relatively linear, just slowly growing. And then as we start to tilt um, our aerofoil on either an aeroplane or on a rotor blade here, and we present more and more of that profile to the airflow, we get rapid increase in drag. And in particular, uh, when we get uh, start to get turbulence and separation on the back of the aerofoil, we get an exponential increase in the uh, drag itself. So that's our coefficient of drag curve uh, and uh, aligned over the top of the coefficient of lift curve. And you can see here, that the drop off here um, at the top of the coefficient of lift curve is our critical angle of attack. So the point at which we get full separation on the back of an aerofoil and we lose the lift and the blade essentially stalls or the aerofoil stalls. And you can see the relationship between the coefficient of drag curve here. Obviously, as soon as we get to that stall point, the blade basically just becomes a flat plate in fast flowing air. It's only drag and an exponential amount of drag with that as well. And we've lost our lift anyway. So let's just look at our start point as we have turned this pitch uh, onto the blade on the advancing side. So we've already established that we've got um, a relatively low pitch or a low, relatively low angle of attack on the advancing side because we don't need it because we've already got a relatively high dynamic pressure and therefore we only need a relatively small coefficient of lift. So therefore we, we can accept a pretty small amount of angle of attack. So we'll assume our angle of attack has started at this point here. And that will be for the advancing side. As for the retreating side, well, we can assume that the angle of attack needs to be pretty high because uh, in accordance with this, we've got a low dynamic pressure, so we must have a high angle of attack here. So we're going to start a little bit higher. So this is where we have started and we can see that the, the coefficient of drag, if we read it across now, So we can see if we read across the, the graph here that the uh, coefficient of drag for the advancing uh, blade is actually relatively small, but for the retreating blade it's actually quite high at our start point. So if we label that on a coefficient of drag equation, so the total drag is the coefficient of drag times surface area times the dynamic pressure. So we'll look at the coefficient drag on the advancing side and on the retreating side. So as we roll the disc over to the left-hand side, we are gonna be pushing this blade up and pushing this blade down. And the effect we have there, obviously, just like pushing a hand up in the air, or as we've seen with flapping to equality as well, um, what we are creating now is a vertical flow of air down through the disc on this advancing side and up through the disc on the retreating side. So the vertical flow of air we know is induced flow. And so we can draw that one on as well, on either side. On the advancing side, on the advancing side, it's going downwards. And on the retreating side, it's moving in the opposite direction. But of equal magnitude. So what we're going to have now when we resolve these vectors, just like any other vector diagram, is a change in the angle of attack. So if we've got a reduction in the angle of attack now, on the advancing side, and an increase in the angle of attack on the retreating side, well that's going to obviously have a bit of an effect on our coefficient of drag. Now, there's one other thing we just need to establish here, and that is from a pure trigonomic uh, basis. And again, this, these diagrams aren't to scale um, and also it's all very simplified. But we also have to uh, acknowledge one thing, which is that the 
rotational airflow here is a lot longer uh, than the retreating blades at the rotational airflow. However, the original induced flow and the new created induced flow, or rate of descent flow, is exactly the same. So from a trigonomic point of view, what we've got is a very long line here with a very short side here. So therefore, the original or the change in the angle of attack is actually going to be much smaller on the advancing side than it will be on the retreating side, where we've got a stubby side of, of one triangle with another stubby side. So therefore, the change is actually going to be a much larger change in the angle of attack. So first of all, when we apply it to here, we have to take that into account. So we're going to have a much larger change in angle of attack on the retreating side. And in this particular instance, it's going to be an increase in angle of attack. So rather than taking a little bite, we need to take a large bite. We'll just apply it here. As you can probably imagine, if we look at the advancing side, we've got a, a change or a reduction in the angle of attack because the blade is moving upwards. However, it's a much smaller angle of attack. So even though we are getting a reduction in the angle of attack, it's only a very small one and it's on a very linear element of the graph here. So big one here for the retreating. We'll just take a small reduction in the advancing blade angle of attack. We can see there's a marked difference in the change, in particular here, of the um, coefficient of drag. Uh, here, we have the uh, change in the coefficient of drag for the retreating side. And then down here, we've got the change in the coefficient of drag for the advancing side. And quite simply, during a uh, left roll in particular, what we find is the, the change in the coefficient of drag for the advancing side is much smaller than the change in the coefficient of drag for the retreating side. And in particular here, it is an increase for the retreating side and a decrease. So we can apply that now onto the equations on both sides. So on this side, we've got a decrease and only a small decrease. And on the retreating side, we've got a large increase. Add that to the fact that we actually have a large dynamic pressure. And a small dynamic pressure on the retreating side. So at first you would think that because the advancing side has a much higher dynamic pressure and therefore will be the dominant side during any sort of roll maneuvers. Um, in other words, any increase or decrease on drag on the advancing side because it is the dominant side will overall dominate the overall uh, drag for the disc. In this particular instance, you can see that even though the dynamic pressure on the retreating side is smaller, the drag is so much larger uh, on that side, or the coefficient of drag, that it dominates the whole disc. And the primary reason for that is because of this extremely exponential nature of the coefficient of drag curve that we have. So that's the first reason why we get uh, an, an element of increase in torque as we roll to the left. So there's a couple of factors we just need to consider as we move forwards. So the first one is the retreating blade um, its change in angle uh, of attack is actually going to be larger. The second and most important part really is of the exponential nature of this curve, meaning that any change on the retreating side is going to be more extreme than any change on the advancing side with regards to the coefficient of drag. And as we look at this, we can see that all of this is based on the, the change in the angle of attack. And that change in angle of attack is caused by the change in induced flow here, the increase on this side and the decrease on this side. And the other important factor here is that the faster we roll to the left, uh, in other words, you know, the more extreme input we put into the cyclic and therefore the faster the disc rolls to the left, the faster the flow of air is going to be coming down through the disc or up through the disc on the retreating side. 
and therefore the larger this little line is going to be, or the larger the amount of rate of the centre is going to be, and therefore the larger the angle of attack is. And so now looking at this chart here, or this graph, you can see if we have a large change in angle of attack, then we're going to get a large movement up towards this exponential side. Uh, and even though we will get a large movement down the um, the coefficient of drag curve for the advancing side, because it's broadly linear, the change in, in the coefficient of drag is very, very minimal. So the magnitude of roll or the rate of roll is going to uh, increase or decrease um, that induced flow addition uh, and therefore change the amount of uh, drag that we've got. And as always with all of these, as we increase that drag, we have to increase the torque to maintain the NR on the blade. So we've got one last point to look at here, um, and that is actually a slightly more defining issue within the roll-induced drag and the torque spikes um, than you might realise, and that is um, retreating blade stall. And we can see it a little bit more clearly now on this graph, and I alluded to it earlier. Um, as we, as we are moving along, especially at high speeds or at high power settings where we've got a high pitch on the blade, we will find that the advancing blade will be okay, but the retreating side, right at the tip, there will be elements right on the very edge of um, its stalling angle. So you can already see, I sort of put it on this graph before, this is where the start point is in this particular scenario, but if we are moving extremely fast with very high power settings, therefore requiring a really high coefficient of lift for the retreating side, then our angle of attack will be more up towards the top of our critical angle of attack or top of the lift curve. And you can see if we were at this position and then we rolled over to the uh, left-hand side, in this particular case towards the retreating side, we're going to push that uh, angle of attack up this coefficient drag curve, which likewise will hit uh, the critical angle of attack and if we get a retreating blade stall and we manage to increase angle of attack so much that we get to this point here then we will end up in a situation where we hit our critical angle of attack we get a huge drop off and lift huge turbulence and huge increase in drag now what actually happens a lot of the time when you roll to the left there's a tiny element of the tip here which is very close. And when you roll to the left, you get very close to creating a bit of a stall on the end of the blade. Um, if you roll a little, uh, a little bit more or just give it just a little bit too much in terms of a roll, which is generally speaking what we will do if we are high speed as well, um, then we will quite simply just stall the very, very tip of the blade. Now we might not feel that through the controls because there's only a small amount of it, but we will um, have the, the blade will fill the effects because we'll get a considerable amount of drag right on the tip there where it is moving at its fastest for the retreating blade and um, so we'll find ourselves getting um, a large spike up this uh, coefficient of drag curve and therefore a large spike in the drag overall for the retreating side which will as I've already talked about completely dominate um, the overall drag for the disc itself. So a large proportion of the time um, when you roll severely over to the left-hand side, you are going to be uh, encountering an element of uh, retreating blade stall, even though it's not an extreme amount of it. But we've just looked at the left roll and then powered flight. Clearly, as we roll to the right-hand side, you can see it's exactly the same. Uh, as I roll to the right, I'm going to move the angle of attack from the starting point over to the uh, left-hand side of the retreating uh, blade number one position here. So we're going to reduce the angle of attack, therefore we're going to reduce that coefficient of drag. Likewise, we're going to increase the angle of attack as we roll to the, the um, uh, right with the advancing side due to the flapping down. However, because the retreating blade is up on this exponential part of the graph, any change is going to dominate again. So in this particular case, we, we managed to really quickly get out of this bad zone on the coefficient of drag curve. So a roll to the right will see a nice big decrease in drag, um, whilst the increase in drag that we're getting from the advancing side is minimal because of the linear nature of this curve down here. 
And clearly the same remains true for the auto rotation as well. So when we're in auto rotation, the only real difference is rather than this first green line here for the induced flow, um, we just have a rate of descent flow. And so as I roll over to the left, all I'm doing is I'm increasing my rate of descent flow and I'm increasing my angle of attack on this side. And likewise, uh, I'm going to be reducing the rate of descent flow and reducing the angle of attack on that side. So it's the same concept, whether we're power on, power off um, and descending um, in auto rotation or forwards in forward flight. The only minor difference is that obviously the pitch angles would be slightly different um, if we're in auto rotation um, as opposed to forward flight. But the concept remains the same that on this side, we've got a very slow moving blade. Um, and on this side, we've got a very fast moving blade. If anything, during auto rotation, um, there's more proportion within the dynamic pressures. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to say about the roll induced drag. And like I said, that is uh, one theory for it. And it seems like a slightly more accurate theory because essentially it brings into effect the magnitude or the rate of roll, which will dictate the amount of drag and therefore the amount of torque spike you're going to see as you roll into the left or right. I hope it's been useful. As always, put any comments in the bottom uh, or questions or uh, amendments uh, and I'll get back to you. Thank you.